Hello, handsome. I hope you got your black lipstick on for this one because this is part three on the channel series on the history of punk music. This video is on post-punk specifically, which covers everything from the end of 1970s punk all the way to goth. Like I've said in the last video, I'm gonna try and make it so that you don't have to go and watch the other two parts in order to understand this one, but it's definitely there if you wanna check it out. Let me know who your favorite post-punk band is in the comments down below and let's get started. Also, I will do what I do for all my genre videos and put in the description a Spotify playlist of all the music that you're going to hear throughout the video. So where are we after the last video? In the late 1970s, punk rock and its subculture had come into the mainstream and then shattered into a million pieces in just a few short years. Major punk rock artists had either disbanded or moved on from the core of punk sound. The scene expanded so quickly that it soon became oversaturated and those who started the movement grew bored of how limiting pure punk was. I also want to add something too because I don't think I touched on it quite as hard as I should have in the last video. That original punk wave with all the 1970s bands was huge. It was one of the most culturally important movements of the 20th century and I don't say that lightly. It was a subculture that was very important to young people and impacted everything from fashion to art to even how young people viewed politics. Punk showed people first and foremost that you could do things independently and without a lot of prior knowledge and the whole DIY thing that punk prided itself on was a major component of this. I think Simon Ingram from National Geographic says it best with, quote, The surge of and appetite for the punk scene in the late 1970s and early 1980s wasn't limited purely to the music. It became an ideology, spawning literature, poetry, fashion, and political defiance. However, in this video, we are focusing specifically on the music and what came after that original 1970s wave. I think punk's greatest legacy is that it inspired an army of younger people to go Go out there, start a band, push boundaries, and do whatever they wanted without any prior knowledge or any kind of skill level. So what is post-punk? Well, obviously it's what came after punk rock, but in terms of a music genre, it's basically punk's artsier cousin that doesn't smell as bad. Post-punk is kind of an umbrella genre that came out in the late 1970s, is pretty loosely defined, and encompasses a lot of different bands that came out directly after punk's peak, or in some cases came up alongside punk rock. A lot of these bands either, one, came after and were directly influenced by that first wave of 1970s punk, with a lot of them meeting at shows for the Sex Pistols or other bands. Two, were actually part of that first wave of 1970s punk bands. Or three, in some cases were around before punk had its peak. And if that sounds confusing or overly complicated to you, then welcome to the world of punk subgenres. I will be holding your hand through all of this though, so go ahead and step away from that ledge for me. It's also important to note that the bands in this genre would not only influence each other, but a lot of the artists that came after them. The sound of post-punk can be all over the place, but essentially it took the stripped down sound of punk and dressed it up with more experimentation and genre fusions. These bands messed with song structures, they used new studio techniques, and in a lot of cases were far darker sounding than their predecessors. Post-punk absorbed the spirit of punk rock, but gave the genre longevity by experimenting with its formula and diversifying its sound. I think Simon Reynolds says it best in his book, Rip It Up and Start Again, with, quote, Punk briefly united a motley array of malcontents as a force against, but when the question shifted towards what are we for, the moment slash movement disintegrated and dispersed, each strand nurturing its own creation myth of what punk meant and its own vision of where to go next. Yet, even as the arguments raged, the very disagreements affirmed what was still held in common, punk's revival of belief in the power of music and the responsibility that came with this conviction. It made the question, where to now, worth fighting over. The byproduct of all this division and disagreement was diversity, a fabulous wealth of sounds and ideas that rivals the 60s as a golden age for music. I also want to give a disclaimer. We're going to be talking about the post-punk bands that came out in the late 1970s and early 1980s and why they were so important. And if you don't hear me talk about a specific band in this video, it's probably because I'm saving them for another video in this series. Get out of my face, David. So where is America towards the end of the punk boom? 
So that first big wave of 1970s punk bands really happened between 1976 and 1978. And in New York City, there were a lot of bands that were making big waves. You had the more new wavy bands that were getting commercial success that we are gonna talk about in the next video. But you also had a group that was one of the first bands to play at CBGB who finally released an album in 1977. And this is considered one of the first post-punk records. The band Television started out with vocalist Richard Hell, but they soon kicked him to the curb for butting heads with the real head honcho of the band, Tom Verlaine. The band was playing live at CBGB for years, really honing their craft before they released any music. And in 1977, they released the creme de la creme of New York post-punk records, Marky Moon. If you've ever known someone who owned a turtleneck in college, you can guarantee they had this thing on repeat. The band abandoned the blunt force of their early work for something way more deliberate, and even today you have guitarists worshipping at the feet of Tom Verlaine. May he rest in peace. They pushed the boundaries of the punk genre by placing a greater emphasis on their musicianship and Verlaine's poetic lyrics. Steve Albini, who was the frontman for Big Black and also produced one of Nirvana's records, had actually stated after Tom Verlaine's death, quote, Beautifully lyrical guitarist, underrated vocalist, television made a new kind of music and inspired new kinds of music. Marky Moon is a perfect record. But television were not the only band in America to be making waves in the post-punk scene. Out in the Midwest, you had a lot of bands that were making moves, but few were as eccentric as Pear Ubu. Their first two albums, which both came out in 1978, were really successful critically, and even today get a lot of the same praise that they got when they first came out. The band is self-described as Avant Garage, and they took way more influence from Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart, which led to a sound that was uh, interesting. <laughs> While not super successful commercially, they would be massively influential to the post-punk scene. Peter Murphy, who we will talk about later and was really big in the goth scene, actually covered one of their songs in the 1980s. I'll be real too, they are probably one of my favorite bands to look up live videos for. So that's all fine and dandy for America, but what are the Brits up to at the tail end of the punk boom? Well, funnily enough, the man who would become the face of punk rock grew tired of it almost immediately. Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols would leave the band only a year after their first and only album and start his next project, Public Image Limited. Almost every record label was clamoring for the former king of punk rock, and so the fact that he was branching out and starting a new project was a big deal. But Public Image would not be anything like the Sex Pistols whatsoever. They were far more influenced by reggae and dub music, which led them to even having a bassist that was nicknamed Jaw Wobble. Their first album that came out in 1979 is far better received now than when it first came out. However, their second album is the one that really shows the strengths of the post-punk genre. Metal Box, released in 1979, is far darker than anything the Pistols released, with much more challenging and avant-garde material. Also, the fact that it has such a reggae and dub inspired slant makes it really interesting. Also, the reason it's called Metal Box is because the original version's records came in this big metal canister that made it really difficult to get out and would cause you to scratch it as you're pulling it out, which is a huge dick move, but also hilarious. Public Image were not the only band in Britain to be making waves around this time, though. The band Wire were also part of that original wave of punk music when they released Pink Flag in 1977. They already stood apart in the punk scene with different song structures and things like that, and even their website claims that Wire, quote, could easily lay claim to having been the very first post-punk band. They would definitely up the ante, though, with their next album, which was Chairs Missing, released in 1978, and 154, released in 1979. They get more experimental, they depart from that punk sound even more, and have a greater use of synth. Cause you see up in my bedroom, I've got Sarah Bernard's Wire would go on to influence artists like Henry Rollins and My Bloody Valentine, which would actually go on and cover songs by the band. These bands were not the only ones with some seniority, though, who were making waves in the post-punk genre. Two figures that are considered gods in the punk world both released albums in 1977. 
David Bowie and Iggy Pop would drop their albums Low and The Idiot, respectively, and these two albums went on to influence everyone from the post-punk bands we're about to talk about all the way up to people like Trent Reznor in the 1990s. So just to help anyone catch up since the last video, Iggy Pop, who was considered the godfather of punk rock, got scooped up by David Bowie after Iggy's band The Stooges ended and the two became besties. And just like all other besties in the 1970s, they moved to Berlin, Germany in the middle of the Cold War to kick their drug habits. David Bowie's album Low would be the first of what people call his quote Berlin trilogy, which he worked on with Brian Eno, who we will absolutely be talking about more in future videos. Brian, I love you. Low was characterized by being far colder and electronic, and thanks to the help of Brian Eno, had a lot of ambient sections, with the second side being mostly instrumental. Always The Idiot, which was made around the same time as Low, shares a lot of its heavy experimentation. Bowie wrote all of the music with Iggy Pop, and this was actually Iggy's first album since The Stooges, and it's honestly amazing that this is just as influential as his work with The Stooges. These two albums influenced all of the bands that we're about to talk about, and even some of the ones that we've already talked about. Something that I'd also like to keep hammering on is that post-punk took a lot of influence from other genres. There was an emergence that was happening in the 1970s of more progressive music coming from Germany that was having a huge impact on Britain. Kraut rock was a genre coined by the British music press that was really a catch-all term to describe a wide array of diverse bands playing more experimental rock music out of Germany. One of the unifying characteristics of the genre was the goal of moving rock forward, whether that be by removing the rhythm and blues element, adding colder synthesizers, or stripping everything down to its bare essentials. Bands like Can, Kraftwerk, and New are some prime examples of bands that inspired the British youth. There were a lot of post-punk bands that were influenced by the Germans, but there was one in particular that really took it to the next level. And they were out of a burgeoning scene that was coming out of a specific part of Britain, Manchester. So the scene that was happening in Manchester, England had been bubbling for a little while. A little bit of history for you. Manchester, England in the 1970s was in a horrible economic state, with a lot of accounts from people who lived there in the 1970s stating that it was pretty bleak and hopeless. It caused a lot of music out of Manchester to be far darker, and in some cases, way more pissed off. One of the bands that made their way out of Manchester is a band that is considered to be the poster child of post-punk. Joy Division. Okay, so here's what I'm going to need you to do. I need you to go to the back of your closet and get out your Hot Topic Unknown Pleasure shirt. I know who you are. I know why you clicked on this video. Go ahead and throw that bad boy on for me for the next two to three minutes because we're going to talk about the most iconic t-shirt design of all time. The band Joy Division formed in 1977 after seeing the Sex Pistols perform live in Manchester. Their early sound was closer to the more thrashing sound of early punk rock before they developed the style they really became known for. Simon Reynolds states in his book Rip It Up and Start Again, which is a fantastic book, I'm going to keep pulling from it, Joy Division's originality really became apparent once they slowed down. Shedding punk's fast, distortion-thickened sound, the music grew stark and sparse. Hook's bass carries the melody, Sumner's guitar leaves gaps rather than fills the mix with dense riffage, and Steve Morris's drums seem to circle the rim of a crater. Curtis intones from a lonely place at the center of this empty expanse. This is also where the band really shows their influence from Krautrock and also from David Bowie's Low. The band's first name was actually Warsaw, which was inspired by a song off of David David Bowie's Low, and Stephen Morris, the drummer for the band, had actually spoken about his influence from Krautrock, stating, quote, The way that they used cut-up music and bits of ambient sound, as soon as I heard it, I thought if I ever start a band, I'd like them to sound a bit like this, as adventurous as this. The band also had an obsession with everything dark and upsetting, which impacted everything from their core sound to their name, which uh, I'll let you look up on your own. All of these influences would come together and lead them to create one of the most critically acclaimed albums of all time, Unknown Pleasures, released in 1979. 
Unknown Pleasures was recorded with a lot of unconventional studio and recording techniques, like recording all the parts of a drum separately or adding a short delay to certain parts of a track. The end product was something that sounded cold, sparse, and wintry, and really encapsulates the post-punk genre in a single project. I've been waiting for a guy to come and take me by the hand. Unknown Pleasures was an immediate success and even today is considered one of the most critically acclaimed albums of the 20th century. This is evidenced even by its album cover, which most people have seen even if they don't know where it's from, with even Disney putting it on a t-shirt at one point. Their singer Ian Curtis would take his own life in 1980 after recording both Joy Division's second album and their most well-known single, which would be about his failed marriage, Love Will Tear Us Apart. Joy Division would go on to influence everyone from the post-punk bands that we're about to talk about all the way to rock band The Killers in the 2000s and even rapper Danny Brown. They weren't the only band in Manchester, though, that would make a name for themselves in the post-punk scene. The band magazine, who was also out of Manchester, got their start around the same time as Joy Division and made a name for themselves early on. Their singer, Howard DeVoto, who had just left his group Buzzcocks in 1977, wanted to make music that moved away from the punk mentality. Magazine is a highly influential band, not only because of DeVoto, but also because of their powerhouse guitarist, John McGeoch. McGeoch not only came out of Magazine, but also went on to play with Susie and the Banshees and made some of their most well-known material. Magazine released their debut album, Real Life, in 1978, which featured the lead single Shot by Both Sides and would actually put them on the UK charts. Magazine would be hugely influential in the post-punk scene with Johnny Marr of the Smiths actually citing McGeoch as one of his favorite guitarists. Also out of Manchester is a band that have had so many members that they have to have an entire other section on Wikipedia just for their band members. Like, look at this. Come on. What are we doing here? We are, of course, talking about The Fall. The Fall formed in 1976 and maintained a huge cult following throughout their career. Due to their constant lineup changes, they would pretty consistently change their sound with the only constant member being their lead vocalist, Mark E. Smith. Mark was famously difficult to get along with and would often fire his bandmates and at one point had even stated in an interview, quote, if it's me and your granny on bongos, it's the fall. Cedric Bixler from At The Drive-In and The Mars Volta had actually cited The Fall and Mark as an influence, stating that Mark was, quote, one of the pillars of influence for me as lyricist and troublemaker. I've built trust in people based on whether they owned and actually loved Fall records. So at this point, you may be thinking to yourself, well, this is great, but there are a lot of dudes in this genre. Which to that I say, kinda, yeah. So in this next section, I want to highlight a few groups who were just as important to the post-punk genre as their male contemporaries. A lot of the woman-led UK bands in post-punk really pushed the boundaries of what the genre could do while also giving some of the most raw performances of this era. So starting off, we have to talk about the band The Slits, who really took the reggae influences of punk as far as they could go thanks to the leadership of frontwoman Ari Up. So... Quick side note, something that I wanted to touch on is, if you haven't already noticed by now, is that punks loved reggae music, which you can kind of already tell by its influences on bands like The Clash or Public Image. As far as I could find, the reason behind this is that punk and reggae were both countercultural movements that were highly political, and so punks really found a kinship with those in the reggae genre. And the band The Slits really showed this influence more than any other band that I know of. Unlike bands like The Clash, who really kind of took some influence from reggae and put it into their music, The Slits were equal parts reggae and punk rock. The group would actually be sought out by Malcolm McLaren, thinking they could be the female version of the Sex Pistols, but the Slits ended up not signing with him since he was a fucking creep. Their 1979 album cut would show the band at their strongest and featured an iconic album cover of the band members shirtless in tribal getup that I will not be showing here in full. Tonight. 
band that would be directly influenced by the slits and would actually take in their drummer after she had left the slits were the raincoats their founding members are gina birch and anna da silva and was started after birch was inspired by seeing the slits perform live the raincoats are an interesting group that i feel have more of a raw sound than anyone else in this video Kurt Cobain, the frontman for Nirvana, had actually echoed this as well when he was asked to provide liner notes in 1993 for the reissue of their debut album, stating, quote, Rather than listening to them, I feel like I'm listening in on them. We're together in the same old house and I have to be completely still or they will hear me spying from above and, if I get caught, everything will be ruined because it's their thing. They definitely don't sound anything like the Slits, though, even though they shared the same drummer on that debut album. They don't really have the same reggae influence, but are far more experimental. <laughs> Keeping with the post-punk lineage, the band Young Marble Giants had actually stated that the Raincoats had taken them in under their wing when they signed to their label. Young Marble Giants formed in 1978, and their front woman Allison Staten really stood apart from other vocalists at the time in how toned down her singing was, with Simon Reynolds describing it as having a, quote, seductive ordinariness. This isn't meant to be an insult, though, and many, including myself, see this as one of the strengths of their music. The rest of the band is also extremely minimal, with not a whole lot going on at one time. So I make a brand new life. Something that's really interesting about these bands is not only were they moving around in the same circles, but they would actually go on to influence a lot of the same bands in the future. In fact, Kurt Cobain had written in his journals his top 50 by Nirvana, referring to 50 records that he held in high regard, and included in this list are all three of these bands. Okay, so this whole video was outlined very neatly, and then I realized that this next band doesn't really fit in any of these sections, so they get their own. It's fine, Gang of Four, we'll just move everything around you. Gang of Four is a post-punk band that formed in the late 70s in Leeds, England, a city which did and still has a strong university culture. The group started out when they were still students and their studies would play heavily into their music. Their material is very political, leaning more towards the left side of the spectrum. As for their sound, they incorporate a lot of influences from funk music, and this is one of the few bands in this video that you can actually dance to. All of these elements would be brought together on their debut album, Entertainment, released in 1979. Most of the lyrical content would be cast in a Marxist lens. The band really implemented their left-leaning politics on this, with even the cover stating, quote, The Indian smiles. He thinks that the cowboy is his friend. The cowboy smiles. He is glad that the Indian is fooled. Now he can exploit him. This album would also incorporate a lot of those funk elements and have an overall studio sound that's really dry with almost no reverb and everything in your face. Entertainment is actually one of the albums that again showed up on Kurt Cobain's top 50 list and even Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers had cited Gang of Four as one of his influences. And now we get to talk about the goth bands. Yeah. And honestly, goth rock deserves its own video because there's way more than I can cover in this section, but I definitely want to hit on the major points because it was a huge part of the post-punk genre. A lot of the bands that we are going to talk about in this section came from the punk or post-punk scene, but definitely had their own sphere of influences that drove them into the goth lane. A lot of these bands took the shock and horror aspect from artists like Alice Cooper or The Cramps and dressed it up in a darkened version of what the glam scene was offering in the 1970s. The music itself is incredibly dramatic. The lyrics conjure images of vampires, death, and romanticism. The music is atmospheric and feels like you've stumbled into a dark cathedral filled with twanging guitars and eerie synthesizers. There is a long history of where goth music came from, but many consider Square One to be the track Bella Lugosi's Dead by Bauhaus, released in 1979. Bella Lugosi's Dead. Bauhaus is a group fronted by goth legend Peter Murphy that really encompassed the best parts of the culture. Cold, frightening music, a dark, vampiric fashion sense, and great cheekbones. Honestly, their music holds up really well, and they are one of my personal favorite groups from this era. 
It's hard to overstate just how important Bauhaus was to the goth scene with them not only being credited as having the first goth single, but also with Peter Murphy being credited as the godfather of goth. They certainly deserve their dead flowers, but they were actually predated by a woman who many called the queen of goth, Susie Sue. Susie and the Banshees actually made their mark on the post-punk scene before Bauhaus when they released their debut album, The Scream, in 1978. Their debut album showcased that initial evolution of punk to post-punk with an emphasis on gloomier elements and the rhythm section driving the music forward. Bassist Peter Hook from Joy Division had actually cited this as one of his favorite records. Susie's influence went farther than just the music she made with the Banshees, however. Just her image is so iconic that a lot of people took inspiration from her, and even to this day, she is the template for many getting into goth culture. We're going to come back to Susie in a bit because now we have to celebrate your birthday. And what is a celebration without a birthday party? This birthday party, though, is much more morbid than the one you had at McDonald's growing up. The Birthday Party was a post-punk band that was led by Nick Cave and came out of Australia before they moved to London and released a track that would be influential in the newly budding goth scene, Release the Bats, in 1981. Release the Bats has everything that makes goth so appealing. Sinister music, sex appeal, and a whole lot of bats. The Birthday Party as a band wouldn't last very long after this track. However, their frontman, Nick Cave, would go on to have a very long and successful career with his band, The Bad Seeds, which I also recommend you checking out. Growing up, when I didn't know anything about anything, there was really only one band that I even knew about from this scene. It's probably the one goth band that even your mom knows about. The Cure. The Cure started out as a pretty typical post-punk band, taking influence from the bands around them before releasing the track that wouldn't only direct their sound moving forward, but would also be a staple in the goth canon, A Forest, released in 1980. This song and the album that it came off of would show The Cure arriving at that goth style that they would become known for. A lot of the elements on here, like the flanged out guitars and just an overall gloomy atmosphere, would show up on future records by The Cure. Their highly acclaimed 1982 album Pornography would perfect those elements and feature some of frontman Robert Smith's bleakest lyrics and most gut-wrenching vocal performances. Really just a great album to throw on for the grandkids. I also think it's really cool that Robert Smith would actually go on to play with Susie and the Banshees for a little bit while he was still leading the cure. A lot of what made Goth so unique is that it developed in the underground for a good while and had, still has, such a unique identity. It couldn't stay in the underground forever though, and much like the core bands that came before them, Goth, and much of post-punk, would find its way out of the underground and into the mainstream. The 1980s was one of the most important decades in popular music. It's not really a surprise that Punk's descendants, no, not those descendants, would fuel a lot of what made the 80s so great. We'll get into the real nitty gritty of this when we talk about New Wave in the next video, but post-punk was also throwing its hat into the ring. Susie and the Banshees would kick off the decade by introducing a lot of people to goth culture in the video age when they went back to back with their two biggest hits, Happy House, and Spellbound. These would come off of their albums Kaleidoscope, released in 1980, and Juju, released in 1981, respectively. <laughs> Cure would be the ones to carry the goth torch through most of the 1980s, however. Pretty much after that 1982 album, which I'm not trying to say too many times for YouTube reasons, they veered heavily into a pop direction. There's a reason that The Cure is still one of the few bands in this video that you'll still hear on the radio. They would release their biggest hits towards the end of the decade and beginning of the 90s, which I'm sure many of us have heard at this point. They would also drop what many consider their best album, Disintegration, in 1989. This album would harken back to their pure goth roots and show that post-punk could hold its own far after its peak. Oh, yeah. 
It wasn't just the goth bands, though, that would have a lot of commercial success. There was a band out of Manchester that took a lot of influence from post-punk and would have a lot of mainstream success in the UK, The Smiths. The Smiths took the romanticism of the post-punk bands, but put much more funk influence behind it. Today, they've been characterized as jingle pop, but their roots very much came out of post-punk, and even their guitarist owns that label. Johnny Marr had told Noisy in 2013, quote, My generation were the wave after post-punk. I've called myself a post-punk musician because unusually there's been no tag put on the wave that I came out of. The Smiths are a highly acclaimed band and one of my personal favorites. And although they had some really, really big albums, their first single that really kicked them off was This Charming Man in 1983. We're not done though. We got to talk about U2. They are quintessentially the post-punk band that has garnered the most success out of this entire genre. Now I can already hear your bony fingers typing in the comments section that I hit my head too hard to include U2 in this video, but hear me out. U2 started out in the very tail end of the post-punk scene on their earlier records before evolving into the far more commercial sound that they're known for now. The reason that I'm including them is because U2 shows just how influential post-punk would become. They have since become one of the biggest arena rock bands in the world, but they really had their roots in the post-punk genre. This is a band that took heavy influence from bands like Joy Division, and it really shows on their debut album, Boy. Ultimately, post-punk carried on the legacy of punk rock in a way that the other subgenres couldn't. We're going to talk about hardcore punk in the last part of this series, and that obviously had a huge influence on a lot of stuff that came after it and was far more true to the punk ethos, but post-punk really innovated the genre to the point where it gave longevity to a genre that was already on its way out after a couple of years. I don't think that punk would have the legacy that it has today without the innovations made by the bands in this video. I enjoy putting this video together and it introduced me to a lot of older albums that I honestly didn't know about until I got into this. And the next video in this series is going to be on New Wave, which I hope you tune into. I'm also going to recommend Rip It Up and Start Again because it is a really fantastic book and it helped me write not only this video, but also it's gonna help me write the, the next few ones. I'm gonna wrap it up though because this is a really long video. And if you've made it to this point, I really want to thank you for watching this entire thing. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Mm -hmm.